All right, so we've actually done a great job of being on time with all the sessions. So it'd be a shame if I were to drop the ball and make us off time for the last one. So let's begin. Um, our first paper is going to be Machine Learning Classification Methods and Portfolio Allocation uh, by Yang Bai. Please take it away. All right. Thanks for having us on um, the program. Let me share my screen. Um, quick. I guess see my slides. No, I see some code. Oh, sorry, probably wrong. Let's see this one. There we go. Okay, all right. Okay, so um, thanks again for having us on the program, and it's a great opportunity um, for us, and I do appreciate that. Uh, so this is a joint work with my co-author Quintara Putuantam who should also be in the audience, and, and she is my advisor as well. Uh, so this is a recent work, we're still uh, working on it, and uh, we uh, very much look forward to the uh, uh, comments. So our work, uh, this paper is basically motivated by you know, two literatures, right? The first one is the information economics. Basically, we know that machine, I mean, the market efficiency uh, is defined as information efficiency, right? Basically, current prices should reflect all information and there should be no uh, pricing error. And in that situation, we can already predict future returns. Um, and, uh, uh, and in that literature, we also know that there's a series of papers uh, documenting uh, the um, you know, information efficiency is not really um, completely possible like for, for the full, full version of it. And the noises can actually reduce the quality uh, of the information in the market, right? So um, beyond that literature, we also based our study on the uh, recent development in the uh, financial machine learning literature about the return predictabilities, especially for the, the future um, uh, cross sections, right? So we have documented uh, very strong evidence uh, recently with uh, the development of machine learning uh, in the predictability. And, and there's also a new paper in GF this year uh, talking about that the prices are very lazy and information will be reflected uh, with lags, right? Okay, so uh, what we want to do with this, this paper is to fill several uh, gaps in the literature, right? First of all, we want to complete the finance machine learning, um, you know, literature with uh, some aspects from classification, right? At the same time, we want to leverage the setup to examine the machine, uh, the, the, you know, through the machine learning and the predictability to examine the, um, um, the, the market efficiency, right? Specifically, we're looking at this problem from the information efficiency um, perspective, right? And we introduce binomial tests. Um, and uh, um, beyond our setup and the tests that we do, we also dig into uh, the details behind the models, right? We just want to know what the models are doing and what kind of uh, stocks across their lifetime uh, are more predictable, right? Uh, so we did that and we also construct a mayor uh, to actually uh, tell us a little bit about the models failing during the process of their prediction, right? Uh, this is not something that can be easily done with numerical uh, predictions. Right? So um, that's a basic introduction uh, of our uh, models and the uh, entire logic of uh, our study. So let me tell you a little bit about the setup, right? A little bit about the setup. So our setup is kind of straightforward. Um, we look at the deciles as our target and we use them as our classes for the classification part. And we include 22 distinct models, right? Uh, we do not really tune the hyperparameters that are directly related to structures. Uh, for example, number of layers, number of neurons in the layers, um, and the uh, number of leaves, right? We just directly train them um, with the prefixed uh, architectural um, uh, specifications. And um, we, all, we also include a pretty standard data, I think, in the literature. Uh, and include 300, uh, more than 300 predictors. And uh, we end up with uh, over 3 million operations throughout the time window that we're looking at. Um, and we only apply uh, filters based on the uh, uh, exchanges and the share, hold, uh, the, the share code, right? So we only include um, common shares, basically. So um, in the end, into the statistics, in the end, we have about 26,000 distinct stocks that are included and started. Uh, so we also follow the uh, um, basic literature and the logic um, by uh, Martin and Nico 2020 and uh, Fama and French 2018 
in the sample splitting part. Specifically, um, we emphasize on our uh, combined cross-validation, right? So we train with uh, prior half, uh, the, the, the first half of the time window that we're looking at and predict the next half. And we also train with the next half to predict the first half. And we combine them together to do a big uh, overall cross-validation and present the results uh, so that we can have an overview of the time window that we covered. Um, basically, the metrics are very standard as well. So uh, we look at off sample economic performance for sure, right? Uh, we look at uh, uh, you know, returns and other metrics such as uh, uh, shop ratio, right? And, and, and um, uh, cumulative, I mean, the, the uh, uh, CEQ, right? So equivalence return. Uh, and we also uh, want to study the significance from the statistical time, uh, per kind, kind of perspective, right? So we um, most importantly, we, uh, we, we look at accuracy as a proxy for uh, the evaluation on the statistical part. Right? And beyond those, we report for uh, factor model tests, and uh, uh, we include the binomial test, which is a central test in our uh, setup. So binomial test, basically, uh, in our setting, uh, can be seen as a joint test for out-sample prediction accuracy and market efficiency. Right? So testing proxy is this accuracy itself. And uh, we just directly define accuracy as correctly predicted portion of return states because we have a very balanced data. It's not exact balance because we have boundary areas when we define the cells, um, but it's, it's super balanced, right? Uh, and it's nature, so on nature. Um, so why we can do it? Because you know, uh, in our setup, we are using uh, classification. Therefore, we know what's right, what's wrong, right? So we know what a prediction is correct prediction, and the correct prediction can be seen as a success in the Bernoulli trial, right? And this directly enables us to use the binomial test as the main test for our, um, you know, class statistical part for um, for telling whether our models surpass a certain threshold, right? And those for those threshold, we include two benchmarks, right? The first benchmark is a naive classifier, which delivers no information accuracy, as the first benchmark is directly implied by uh, you know, the uh, efficient market hypothesis, that is, you know, we cannot really learn any information about future returns. Uh, and we also include another benchmark, which, which is the one we call Martingale classifier. So Martingale classifier is under the assumption that it returns for uh, the memoryless process, which means, you know, the best prediction for tomorrow's performance is going to be today's performance. Uh, so uh, we going to use that as another benchmark as well. Um, and in, 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 in fact, uh, we, we actually include a pool of um, um, classifiers to actually figure out what is the most conservative one for the naive classifier to produce a no information accuracy. Um, and therefore, uh, our uh, binomial test can be seen as a joint test, right? It's a test uh, whether there are some useful content about future returns that we can learn directly from historical public information. It's also a test about whether we have a uh, useful uh, and working modeling structure that can actually extract this kind of useful content uh, from the historical public information. And beyond these two points, right, um, you know, combine them, we can uh, have an implication about whether the information is efficient and whether the market is efficient and whether there are pricing errors and, and, and information, um, you know, whether the information is fully reflected in current prices. So that's a general idea of, about our uh, central tests. Uh, so then getting to uh, the um, uh, empirical results that we have. So first, I just wanted to do, uh, briefly show you that the alpha sample predictability is there for economic side. Um, this is then, um, you know, basic uh, performance evaluation with uh, some of these metrics, shock ratio, CQ, and cumulative return uh, on a log scale, and the maximum drawdown. The, the plus sign you see with a green color uh, indicates a long position in the best performing uh, stocks that we predict, uh, and the cross in red indicates the long position in the worst performing stocks that we predict. And the diamonds indicates the long short portfolio that we have. As you can see, with this setup, we have uh, you know, systematically um, evidence about out of sample predictability in, uh, in uh, economic kind of things, right? And the uh, predictability is still there uh, with our value weight setup, right? So it's, it's still there. Uh, it looks like that in out of sample comparison, our model can distinguish the good performing stocks from the bad performing stocks and uh, aggregate them together. The, the out of sample non show portfolio can um, produce a very high shop ratio. Right. Okay, 
So that's uh, uh, that's basics about the uh, predictability from the uh, economic standpoint. And beyond that, we also have uh, the factor tests. So we include four different factor models, uh, including Fama 23 factors, Kahar 4 factor, Q4 and Q5 from John's website uh, for the factors, right? And it turns out that these factor models cannot really explain the performance uh, in output sample, right? Um, based on the, the uh, uh, significant RFOS. So that's uh, basics about the uh, predictability in terms of the economic performance. Now let me get into the uh, discussion on the uh, binomial test, right? So binomial test is again the central part for us to learn about whether we can, uh, you know, use the historical information to predict the future, right? It turns out based on the uh, statistical measurements uh, that we choose, uh, which is this column, right? The accuracy nearly as correctly predicted portion um, of the out sample uh, return states, right? Uh, and we compare this accuracy column against our two benchmarks, the no information accuracy and the marking go accuracy. It turns out that you know, our accuracy is a lot higher than these two benchmarks, indicating that our models can actually learn some useful contents based on uh, the historical public information to predict future, right? To predict the future. And it turns out the, the bonds, the confidence interval are actually very tight indicating you know, um, you know, the, the, the accuracy about this estimation, this measurement is also high. Okay, so uh, based on this um, observation, we can conclude that the out of sample statistical predictability is established with the historical information and we can actually measure the accuracy directly right, throughout the, the time window from 1963 to 2019, right? And the accuracy in out of sample uh, based on our prediction is around 15 to 16%. And the implication from this observation is that there is information or is useful content that we can learn based on historical information and our models can actually extract this kind of useful contents from historical public information to make the predictions. And the third implications, of course, based on um, this out of sample predictability, we bring up the question about the correctness of prices as well as the question about the market efficiency. And beyond um, the modeling part and the predictability, the predictability part, we also uh, dig into the uh, you know, things behind our model and the performance. And we want to know what the model is actually doing and why some of these stocks are more predictable than the others, right? So first we want to know uh, the importance of the macro data components, right? Remember we have about 300, uh, and then a little bit more than 300 predictors and those includes the macro uh, data components, right? So we did a comparison, right? With or without these uh, macro data components. And it turns out that including or excluding those macro data uh, components, the performance does not really change dramatically, right? It's, it's about the same level. Therefore, you know, throughout the presentation, we actually are presenting the version without the macro data components. We also did this um, um, check on the uh, return state transition probabilities, and we showed that there is a strong uh, evidence that the transition uh, probabilities are not uniformly distributed. Um, so this is the uh, transition probability matrix. As you can see that, you know, these different transitions to different target uh, state, they are associated with different probabilities, right? The different uncertainty level is also indicated by these different levels of uh, probabilities. For example, transition to new return state three and four, they are more uncertain because they are surrounding uh, around uh, the level of 10%, which is you know, the ideal um, super uncertain level in a completely random world, right? And in the extreme uh, kind of um, uh, transition, uh, in these situations, uh, their uh, the, the transition probability is higher and we have these side um, state transitions, right? They, they are they are with the lower probabilities, right? They are with lower probabilities. Lower probabilities also indicates a higher certainty, right? Higher certainty. And it turns out that our model behind the predictability is mining this imbalance of the return transition probabilities, right? So as you can see, um, our model put a high stake in the transition to return state one, and it also put a high stake in the transition to you know, the middle states and extreme states as well, and completely gives up the uh, transitions to return state three and four, right? Because they are associated with higher uncertainty. And this higher uncertainty is also implying, you know, maybe the level of market efficiency 
is kind of different for uh, where you stand in history, right? For the current um, uh, return state. Okay, so um, beyond that, we also search for predictable individual stocks throughout their lifetime, throughout their life cycle. Uh, so we ask the question, what kind of uh, characteristics are associated with you know, highly predictable uh, stocks throughout their lifetime, right? So we group these different characteristics into these categories and we find throughout a, um, through a, a regression analysis, we find the um, um, trading frictions is the only category that is making positive contribution to the off-sample predictability. That is to say, if all the variables in this category increase by one standard deviation, the, the accuracy for that uh, associated stock will actually increase by 6%. And the models, the actual will also feel better if they are predicting the stocks associating uh, associated ways a, a higher trading friction. Right? So that's uh, the, a little bit more about the um, you know the, the predictable stocks. Right? So we also want to learn about you know whether the models have systematic biased preference. Right? Uh, if you remember that. When I was showing the chart here earlier, um, there is one of the model that completely fails. This is uh, our three-layer uh, neural network model, uh, with uh, the first layer being the layer of one uh, one twenty-eight neurons. Right, it completely fails, um, and comparing to the other models, it performs worse than the market. So we dig into the details behind the cause. Right, so it turns out that these models. Despite that we have a super balanced data, you can still have systematically biased preference over certain outcomes and put a high stake on those outcomes. That means they always predict higher probabilities in those outcomes for those return states, right? So we want to, um, you know, correct, obviously, uh, you know, uh, correct those um, uh, biased preference uh, to increase the outsample performance. And uh, if we do that, you know, in our way, we actually, um, just introduce a relative way to use the predicted probability. And if we do that, we see a drastic increase in the overall performance across our models, across our models. And as you can see, uh, the three layer uh, neural network uh, that we just saw we failed our earlier test actually has a, a amazing performance here as well, right? Um, and uh, the, um, let, me, let me check on, um, a virgin ways a super conservative um, setup, excluding the bottom 50% of the capitalization and do a value weight, the performance still zero systematically, right? Uh, comparing to the market performance, uh, the other, um, you know, portfolios based on our models, they deliver you know, two to three fold of the performance, right? So that's, um, um, that's basically our findings. So let me take a little bit of time to conclude. Uh, so first we introduce a new setup, the classification to frame the asset pricing problem. And we, we also do the, uh, a test, right? Central test, the binomial test to test the statistical meaningfulness of the um, efficient market hypothesis. And it turns out that, you know, our models uh, of sample prediction do have some, uh, do, do contain some information about the future uh, return states. And beyond that, we dig into the economic insights. We show that the transition probabilities are not uniformly distributed across the uh, targeting um, return states right, in the future. And our models actually are taking advantage of that imbalance across the return states. At the individual stock level, uh, trading frictions are um, you know, positively related to the off-sample predictability and the models may be biased uh, in general for, the, for their preference over certain outcomes. So that concludes my presentation. And I very much look forward to the discussion by Ahmed. Thanks so much. Wonderful. Thank you, Yang. You made it right on time. In fact, with just about a minute to spare. So let's now move on to the discussion by Ahmed Jusir from NC. Let me stop sharing my screen, actually. Yeah, you got to do that before he can share his. That's OK. I think I got it. Can everyone see my slides? Yep, yep, yep. Yeah, we can see it. Okay, excellent. So, um, uh, 
Thanks very much. I'm going to be discussing uh, this paper by Bayan Pukhran Thong on ML classification methods and portfolio allocation. Um, and I'm really happy to have had the chance to discuss this paper because I guess we're all a little bit biased in this conference. We all believe that ML techniques and principles um, have, a good, have good potential for finance and for asset pricing. And this paper is an example of um, bringing an ML uh, perspective onto a, onto a traditional or rather classic asset pricing problem. Um, so, um, uh, so, so I'll, I'll summarize this with respect to the recent literature that um, that just got published over the past year. There's been papers by Gu Kelly Xu, Freiberger, Neuhill, and Weber published in the RFS. These all take a regression approach to the cross-sectional return predictability problem. So the idea here is that the the model is um, the conditional expectation of the next period returns is some function of predictive variables. I call them x, i, t. These can be firm level characteristics, macro level variables, and so on. Um, but the framing is not so different from um, traditional tests uh, by Greenhand and Zhang, Lewin, and, and so on. Uh, and this is what it would look like pictorially. So pictorially, you have a, a number of firms N in the cross section, each of which is associated to some predictive variables. And it's a regression problem to predict the real value on numeric next period returns. Now, how Bai and Puk Thang Thong differ is they keep the same inputs uh, on the left-hand side here. So you still have a cross-section of firms and associated predictive variables, each one of which is a high-dimensional vector, which necessitates machine learning techniques. Um, but on the right-hand side, the output now is uh, to predict which decile uh, of uh, each firm's next period monthly returns is going to land in, right? So instead of predicting an individual real-valued return for each firm, now the idea is to predict where each firm's next month return is set to land relative to all the other firms next month returns. Uh, and this is where the classification framing comes in. So it's a, a 10 class classification problem. Each decile is a class. Um, and it's easy to see here that this maps very naturally onto forming a long short portfolio. So in the paper by Book Thang Thong Go, uh, they formulate some out of sample trading strategies where firms that are predicted to land in the highest decile, so um, numbered by 10 here on the right. Uh, those stocks are, are put on the long side of the portfolio and firms that are predicted to end up in the lowest decile, numbered uh, one on the left, are shorted. And this is how the long short portfolio is formed and where all of those nice out of sample statistics come from. And in fact, the performance is good. So um, looking at the paper, an equal weighted long short portfolio formed in that way has a monthly sharp ratio of 0.87. Um, and this compares favorably, of course, to the market sharp ratio, compares favorably to um, some published papers by Gu, Kelly, and Xu, who, of course, use a different sample. Um, and this is robust to concerns about con concentration of micro, -caps and, uh, micro cap stocks and, uh, and excessive use of leverage. Um, and there's a whole bunch of other results in the paper. So it's quite a long paper, and there's quite a, a nice empirical characterization of these results to understand um, where predictability is concentrated, for example and comparing classifier accuracies against benchmarks. So this is where the framing about uh, testing the efficient, uh, uh, test of market efficiency comes in. Um, classification accuracy, so the percentage of correctly classified samples is compared against benchmark classification accuracy. And then these are interpreted with respect to market efficiency. I'm gonna have a comment about this coming up. And um, just like many other uh, papers in this vein, um, the authors characterize a feature importance a uh, firm level idiosyncratic volatility is an important feature for both the neural nets and tree-based models. Um, I'm gonna mention a comment regarding this as well. Uh, and there's some other uh, predictive variables that vary based on whether tree-based mo uh, models or neural networks are used. So I think this is a, a, a very interesting application. It's a fresh look at an asset pricing problem through a machine, a pure machine learning perspective, if you like, in the sense that classification, classification is one of the uh, canonical machine learning problems. And as far as I know, this is the first paper I've seen in the asset pricing literature that brings these set of tools and this perspective to bear. So I think it's, I think it's great. And my first comment is actually to big this up a little bit more. So this is a fresh look. This is bringing classification to bear on this problem. And um, because you're at the frontier, essentially, it's good to um, say how your approach um, improves upon or gives a unique perspective that some other approaches don't give. So the, uh, the present approach is to use regression. And in fact, the paper that I'm going to be presenting um, in about half an hour is uh, uses cross-section regression as well. 
What does classification add that cross-sectional regression does not? And you have a few advantages mentioned in the paper that it's easy to calculate predictive accuracy compared to benchmarks, um, assess how predictability varies across stocks. I argue that you could also say the same for regression-based approaches. And also, um, you, uh, another advantage you state is that probabilities of predictions can be quantified. Similarly, there are probabilistic machine learning techniques that focus on the regression case. So I would actually push you and encourage you to think even more about how classificate, uh, what classification brings to the table. And in fact, implicitly, you already do that because this long short portfolio formation or um, estimation of efficient portfolios, if you want to reframe it that way, is, is a very natural consequence of predicting these deciles or these return states of firm level uh, returns. Uh, another application that doesn't actually need these conditional expectations, these numeric values of the returns, is of course risk management, because there you care about extremal values along the firm return distribution. And I think maybe you, you could say something along those lines. Uh, another lead uh, is potentially quantile regression. So of course you're not producing estimates of the return per decile, but um, there is actually a theoretical link between classification and quantile regression in the machine learning literature. So, and there's a reference there. So maybe that's something you pursue. My next comment is about the benchmarks on the Monte Carlo testing. So with the benchmarks, you have two no information benchmarks um, that actually use information in sample and two no information benchmarks that use out of sample information. So perhaps the no information name could be um, improved a little bit. Um, and the framing as well, I, I wonder whether this can be framed as part of the weak form versus semi-strong form debate. Um, another naming question is that you have a Martingale benchmark, which is a little bit different from the classic Martingale hypothesis that prices follow Martingale. So here you're saying that returns follow Martingale. So if you want to really um, talk about market efficiency, then I would try to relate that a little bit to some of the, the literature that came before, if. Uh, my next the next thing I have to say about benchmarks is you use Monte Carlo tests. And my understanding from reading the paper is that you use Monte Carlo because some of your benchmarks are non-deterministic. So they randomly predict according to some distribution you have. Um, but it's not clear exactly how Monte Carlo is being used. And maybe that could be clarified a little bit. Um, so I would guess that the Monte Carlo samples are used to produce average classification values for those. Um, but this relates a little bit to the binomial test. So one of the assumptions of the binomial test is of course the trials should be independent. And it's possible in the machine learning literature to compare, um, some, uh, to look at uh, one classifier's performance versus another on trials being samples within a data set or trials being samples of multiple data sets, whether a classifier has outperformed another classifier on a certain number of data sets and uh, so, so, so to make things a little bit more concrete, here's a classic example of a within data set binomial test from Salzburg. So here the number of trials is the number of samples or firm months in your case in which, um, uh, in which one classifier is correct and another classifier is incorrect. And so you can easily calculate a p-value based on that. You could replace the, tr uh, the samples uh, with number of data sets on which a particular um, classifier outperforms another classifier. So I don't think you do that. Uh, if you do do that, then um, it's then the binomial test sample independence assumption is likely to be violated. But what I think you might be doing is you might be pooling together samples from multiple data sets, each produced by a Monte Carlo simulation. And that's somewhere in the middle between those two approaches. If that's the case, I would still think a little bit about whether that independence assumption holds up or not. So I have a few uh, references in the slides here. Um, I have another comment. I'm coming to the end of my allotted time, so I'll be quick. Um, you, you've done a really good exercise of tr trying to see where um, the classification approach does best and where it falls a little bit shorter in, in, the, um, in the deciles of firm month returns. And it performs very well at uh, predicting transitions between the extremal deciles. So from the lowest decile to the highest decile of firm month returns or the other way around. And you also have a nice... Uh, quantification of the ground truth, you call it, so the true return state transition probability matrix. Um, and you can see here that the, there's also, there seems to be some persistence among those extremal deciles as well. And so this made me think about whether your classification approach is most suited to high volatility stocks in particular, because high, volatil high volatility stocks may end up 
in the extremal deciles of the firm month um, the distribution. And they also may be persistent with volatility clustering. So that could be something to relate as well, maybe to the risk management angle too. And finally, um, with the deciles, it'd be nice to see a little bit of empirical validation as well. So are the deciles actually deciles in the sense that each one contains a tenth of the firm uh, months? Um, are the decile mean returns non-overlapping? And finally, with the, uh, with the deciles, is it possible maybe to try, I know you've done a lot of work already, but to try maybe the, the, the least computationally intensive algorithm on something like quantiles or even terciles? It may be that you, you're making them work a little bit too hard on all these deciles and correctly classif classifying into so many classes. And you would actually see a, a much bigger improvement in performance if you used terciles or, or, uh, or quantiles. Okay, so that's the end of my comments. Uh, I think it's a really great paper and uh, I'm really looking forward to, to, to seeing it progress. And it's a great fresh look at a classic asset pricing problem using machine learning. Thanks for the opportunity. All right, thank you so much for the presentation, Young and the discussion, Ahmed. So now we'll have uh, Scott present sharding by machines. Sorry, I had to turn my mic on. Can you see my screen now? Yeah, you're good. I can see you and hear you. All right, well, thank you to conference organizers for choosing my paper for the program. This is joint work with Hoping Xiao and Yusin Xia. Um, all of us are from Georgia State. The title of our paper is Charting by Machines. So the motivation for this is really um, the, the, the academic literature has basically declared charting or technical analysis a fruitless investment technique. Okay, empirical um, research, which really ended many years ago, um, found no evidence for this in the academic literature. Nonetheless, this is very widely used by investment managers still. And this suggests to us that there's more merit in technical analysis than academic research understands. So the objective of our paper is very simple. We're gonna simply test the efficient market hypothesis, the, the weak form of the efficient market hypothesis using machine learning. And the machine learning forecast, we're gonna use machine learning to generate forecasts of future returns um, based only on data discernible from price plots. So basically data that would be visible to someone looking at a historical price plot of the stock. And we're gonna use this information to predict the cross section of future stock returns. And just to summarize the findings, we find that the predictor, the machine learning based forecast is a very strong predictor. Um, the long short portfolio earns about a percent a month over the past 50 years, 50, 60 years. Um, and it predictive power strong in most sub periods, it holds in large stocks, um, and the forecasting relation is stable. I'll talk about exactly what that means shortly. Um, and this is more the momentum and reversal. The, the nonlinearities really matter. So um, I think in the interest of time, I'm going to skip the literature. Um, suffice it to say that the technical analysis literature has gone sparse for the past decade or so. Um, but machine learning, as we know, in asset pricing is becoming much more popular and, and there's a lot of work being done there now. Um, so I think the big contribution of this paper is, whereas a lot of papers look to kind of synthesize the information in, in a large number of predictors, um, this paper is going to identify a new forecast based purely on the machine learning thing. So our sample, we break it our sample covers 1927 through, 2009, through 2019, excuse me. We used the 1927 through 1963 period to optimize our machine learning process. And I'll discuss that shortly. Um, and then we fix our process based on that optimization and we use 1963 through 2019 as our test period. Um, the variable of interest in our paper is our machine learning forecast and as I said before, this is based purely on the cumulative returns over the past year. So the example here is Amazon stock for 2018. Basically, if you did a very coarse monthly plot of Amazon's returns, cumulative returns over um, 2018, this is what you'd see. And the inputs to the machine learning algorithm and the inputs to the forecast are simply the 12 cumulative returns over the past year. 
And we're going to use those to predict the next month's return. So the return in January of 2019 in this example. So <clears throat> to implement the machine learning process, we need to make several implementation choices. Um, we choose over four different types of machine learning architectures, a uh, feed forward neural network, convolutional neural network, long short term memory, and the convolutional neural network combined with long short term memory. We look at two potential loss functions, mean squared error and mean absolute error, three different weighting methodologies. And, and the reasons we look for this, I'm not gonna have time to go into detail with, but they're described in the paper. We look at an equal weighting, and then we look at equal weighting per month, so give each month equal weight. And then we look at giving each month equal weight and value weighting stocks within a month. And, and this is simply for determining the implementation of the machine learning process. And the dependent variable, we also look at four different potential outcome variables for our machine learning process. One is the excess stock return. Then we look at standardized and normalized versions of the stock returns. And then we look at the stock return percentile. So basically, those, the last three are intended to kind of cut down the tails and, and standardize the distribution in some way, shape, or form. As I said, we use data from 27 through 63. Um, to optimize the process. We train on even months from even years and odd months from odd years, and then we evaluate on the other months from this period. Um, there's 96 different combinations of machine learning processes that we examine. Um, we run each of them 30 times because there is some randomness in the, in the, in the, um, in the process. And we take the average of those 30 forecasts. Um, and then we examine the relation between forecast and realized returns um, in our evaluation data. And the evaluation metric we use to figure out which of the 96 potential implementations to choose is simply the time series average of monthly cross-sectional Spearman rank correlation. So we use Spearman rank because what we really care about is the ordering, not the, uh, we don't think we can really predict the stock that's gonna go up 100%. Um, but we can hopefully predict the stocks that will do well relative to those that will do poorly. So here's the results of the optimization procedure. Um, I'm going to cut to the bottom line. Right here is the highest, uh, the best performance we get, which is the CNN, their convolutional neural network with long short term memory, mean squared error, error function. We equal weight stocks within a month um, or equal weight each month. Um, in the fitting process, but uh, and equal weight each stock within a month. And we used a normalized version of the return as the dependent variable. So this is the implementation we go forward with for our main tests. Okay. And then for our main tests, what we do is we take that machine learning implementation and we apply it to expanding windows of data. So basically, we update the data every decade, or the forecast function every decade. We use data for, we fit on data from 1927 through 63, and we use those forecasts for, well, July of 63 through December of 74. Then at the end of 74, we update, we add 10 years of data, or a little more than 10 years in this case, um, refit the, the, the process, refit the machine learning process, and use that forecasting function to generate the forecast for 75 through 1984. Et cetera, down through the end of the sample. So, the first thing we want to test, obviously, is whether this forecast predicts returns, okay, out of sample, obviously. And we use a simple decile portfolio analysis, uh, portfolio sorted on our forecast, machine learning forecast, MLER, NICE breakpoints, valuated portfolios, um, the standard, you know approach that has been um, kind of accepted now in the literature. Um, and what do we see? Well, we see very strong predictive power. We see that um, the average excess return of this portfolio is about a little bit more than 1% per month, highly statistically significant. Um, the forecasts are monotonically increasing. I think it's completely monotonic, not quite perfectly monotonic, but the average excess returns are nearly monotonically increasing across the deciles. Um, the results are similar when we look at alphas with respect to most factor models. So it suggests that this is 
um, not due to risk that's captured by any of these factor models. And then when we look at kind of standard measures of risk, not, not factor risk, but just total risk, we look at standard deviation, skewness, um, value at risk and expected shortfall measures, none of these give any indication that the performance of these portfolios is compensation for risk. So um, we conclude from this that the, the, this evidence really is quite strongly counter to the efficient market hypothesis. So now the rest of the paper basically tries to characterize this predictive power. So first we ask um, whether the predictive power holds for the entire sample period. Is it something that's unique to the early period, to the late period, or to any specific sub-periods? What we see is it's actually quite persistent. Most decades um, generate a little bit over a percent a month, okay? Even 2015 through 2019, the most recent period, the long short portfolio generates over a percent a month. It's not quite statistically significant here, but that's because we only have five years in that sub-period. Um, the one sub-period that doesn't work is 2005 through 2014, and we'll see shortly mm -hmm. there's a few very large losses in 2009 that caused this. Um, so here's a plot of the cumulative returns of the, the long-short portfolio. And like I said, the, the, the predictive power is pretty persistent through the whole sample period, including at the end, there's, there's just 2009, something happened. And, and I'm still trying to figure out exactly what drove this. Um, it's none of the standard, it's, it's not anything you would expect, such as a really strong industry concentration or something of that nature. So I'm still looking into exactly what drives those losses. But that's, aside from that period, the predictive power is pretty persistent. Next, we ask whether the predictive power persists beyond one month. Um, and what we find, so basically we wait K months between forming a forecast and, and forming portfolios. What we find is for up to four months after uh, the, the forecast is generated, the predictive power holds. So if we skip three months before, before forming the portfolios, we still see a statistically significant long short portfolio spread. If we go to four months, it's economically maybe useful or interesting, but statistically it, it loses its power in same five and six months. Um, so we conclude the predictive power holds for at least four months. I think more interesting is, are the next few results, which are that um, we, we ask whether the predictive power holds among large stocks. So to do this, we, we do several kind of um, different versions of large stocks. We look at stocks with only only stocks were, whose market cap is above the Nicaea 20th percentile. And we calculate breakpoints using that same, those same set of stocks. So this column indicates the set of stocks we use to calculate the breakpoints. And this, set, this column indicates the set of stocks that we use to, that we actually hold in the portfolio. And the results are very similar when we use um, only stocks with market cap above the Nicaea 20th percentile. Um, if we sort on NICE stocks only, so we basically use the same universe, but sort on NICE stocks only instead of sorting on all stocks, the results get a little bit weaker, but still strong. And then we keep going and, and looking at smaller and sm or larger and larger stocks, I'm sorry. And even if we look at only the top 500 stocks um, by market cap, we get a still about 70 basis points a month, highly statistically significant. So the result seems to hold among large stocks. Next, we ask whether the forecasting relation is stable through time. What does this mean? We mean what we mean by this is, are there historical price patterns that predict higher, low future returns in the early part of the sample? Are these the same as those that predict um, higher, low future returns late in the sample? And we test this in two ways. First, we use, we look at the performance of these portfolios during certain sub-periods from fits based on data from other sub-periods. And if the relation's stable through time, we shouldn't see much of a difference. I should be able to use a fit from 1963 to predict returns in 2010, for example. If the relation changes through time, then my, my forecasting function based on a fit from 1927 through 1963 should not do well 
in the most recent period. So as the amount of time between the fit period and the return period increases, um, if the relation's stable, the forecasting power should not change. If the relation is unstable, the forecasting power should decrease as the amount of time between these two periods increases. And the second test we do for this is simply to use a rolling window methodology instead of an expanding window methodology to form the forecast. And also we look at a forecast, uh, just a static forecast based only on fitting the data from 1927 through 1963. So when we look at um, bits from one period predicting forecasts or predicting returns in another period. Let's take, for example, um, this row, 1995 through 2014, through 2004. Okay, this is the performance of portfolios during this period based on a fit um, from 1927 through 1963, et cetera. But what we see is using this example, um, and, and there's several other examples here that um, the table is kind of a lot here, but um, basically, even this forecast from 1927 through 1963 does very well, even in 1995 through 2004. And it actually does very well even through 2015 through 2019. In fact, um, the best forecast for 2015 through 2019 comes from a fit of the data from 1985 through 1994. So from this, we conclude that the forecasting relation is quite stable through time. Um, as I said, the second test of this is to look at different versions of our forecast. Our main version uses a, an expanding window. We look at a rolling window, and then we look at a static forecast based on a, a, a fit from 27 through 1963. What we see here, looking at the long short portfolio returns, we see slightly better performance from our, our expanding window forecast compared to our rolling window and then compared to the static. But the performance difference is not that large. Um, so once again, this, this suggests that the, the functional relation between past returns and future returns or, or, or expected future returns is highly stable through time. And, and this, we think this is a very important result because it suggests that a chartist who actually studies charts could potentially learn the patterns over time. They're not changing. Okay, so it, it adds credence to, to, to um, kind of the most simple form of technical analysis or charting. Um, I've got about two minutes. I'm going to go real quick. Then we look at the linearity of the results and we ask whether it's a linear component um, that the, the predictive power comes from the linear component or whether the predictive power comes from nonlinearities in the forecast. And what we see, I'm just going to be really quick here. Um, basically, if I look at the forecasting variables and regress them on the actual forecast, I get an R squared of only 37%, which means that basically only 37% of the um, variation in the forecast is due to a linear relation with the, the input variables to the forecast. And then I do the same sort of thing. I basically look at the forecast in a Fama Macbeth regression setting. Um, I include the forecast along with the inputs. And what we see is even after controlling for all of the, the 12 inputs to the forecast, um, which basically this is a regression methodology, so it's, it's an OLS, so it's a linear relation. These are controlling for all the, any linear relation. Machine learning based forecast still has strong predictive power. So, so we, we conclude that it's really the nonlinear component of the machine learning based forecast. Well, th that contains, or, or at least the nonlinear component does contain a lot of important predictive power. And then I'm going to, I think, skip through this or, or just mention the results real quickly. The big thing with when we look at past returns, we all know about the momentum and reversal effects. So we test whether this is driven by momentum and reversal. And bottom line, um, without going into the details, in part it is, okay? There is a component of the machine learning based forecast that is driven by momentum and reversal. And we would expect that to be the case. It would be um, very unexpected if the machine learning based forecast did not pick up momentum and reversal. 
But even after controlling for momentum and reversal, there's still strong predictive power. So there's something else there besides momentum and reversal. So to conclude, the main finding is that machine learning can detect patterns in past returns that predict the cross-section of future returns. Um, we've characterized this predictive power in many ways. And the big conclusion we draw is that charting has merit. Um, this contradicts the prediction of the efficient markets hypothesis, and it also contradicts some of the, the academic literature that's, that's out there. Um, and I think that, that charting and technical analysis warrants more attention in the academic literature. Thank you. Thanks, Scott. So let's invite back Young to do the discussion. All right, let me share my screen again. Yes, in the screen. Yep. Okay. Um, so thanks for inviting me as a discussion for this paper. This is a one for written, uh, written paper, and uh, um, and it's very interesting um, overall. Uh, and uh, uh, let me actually get into um, a brief summary based on my um, reading throughout the um, uh, the contents. Right. So the um, paper asked a very um, simple intuitive question. And the question is that whether we can predict future uh, cross sections with historical cumulative returns using deep learning, right? And specifically, the inputs are very concise. It's just 12 of them, right? It's 12 of them, 12 of those cumulative returns. And the immediate advantage of this setup is that, you know, without looking at the characteristics, without looking at key factors, this setup bypass the problem in the literature um, of heavily relying on the characteristics. And the problem of that is that, you know, we may use something that is discovered at a later date to predict something uh, that happened in an earlier time. So this is, there is a potential forward looking data leak. And in this way, in this paper, they are using cumulative returns, which is available to everybody uh, since the beginning of the stock market, basically. So they are bypassing this issue. And their setup is quite straightforward. Um, they use a several uh, different architectures right, and, and of their uh, deep learning uh, neural networks. And they're um, responsible as you know, these um, uh, different forms if they excess returns. And they also play with the instant weighting right, throughout the time and cross-sectionally. And they include different objectives for optimization. And, and in the end, they also uh, supply to the literature some of these uh, understanding based on you know, whether we should do dynamic updating of the models uh, every once in a while. And they show that you know, the performance actually are similar with or without this kind of dynamic updating, um, you know, either expanding window or a rolling window. So I, I find these uh, uh, findings are very interesting. Um, and uh, um, just to emphasize again on the main takeaway, right? So the economic outsample predictability is established uh, with their methodology, and factor models can already fully explain the um, you know outsample economic gains by their um, portfolio sorted on the estimator. Um, the performance reduces when we control for size. Uh, however, the performance still there is still significant. And it's wonderful. Um, the, predict, uh, the predict power actually extends to later months, and th this is one of the fascinating points I find um, that is presented in the paper. Um, is you know the, the model itself is, uh, is designed to predict one month ahead, but if you wait and construct the portfolio based on the prediction in a later months, you can still discover the outsample predictability in there. So it's a very interesting point in there, and the model seems very stable across the time. The source of the predictability seems not entirely depending on, you know, the um, uh, momentum or short-term reversal, and and thus naturally implies that our sample predictability leads to the questions about weak form of um, efficient market hypothesis. Right. So this is a general um, uh, takeaway for uh, this paper. So I have uh, several comments, and my comments are mainly focusing on, you know, the potential um, opportunities or the the possible ways to improve this paper in general. So first of all, this is a comment on the 
uh, sort of the, the major direction. I, I, I think uh, I, I see a huge potential and I'm excited for it um, to, to you know, you know, the study on the technical analysis. So um, the motivation of this paper partly is from the technical analysis or, you know, quote unquote, charting, right? So the idea is very attractive. However, the strengths of the link, I think it can be improved. The technical analysis is the process of comparing the return trend against the list of technical analysis indicators uh, or some kind of known graphic patterns such that you know, technical analysis can draw the lines and can, can um, pinpoint the uh, supporting um, point of the prices and the pressure point of the prices. Right? Um, but the paper does not really include as much information on those. So what the algorithm that they do is that uh, they are offering the um, uh, you know a graphic pattern uh, recognition in a numeric prediction way, and this is only on the rec recognition part of the technical analysis. It does not really learn from the images. It, 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 the model is also uh, learning and creating new patterns. It, it's not guaranteed that these new patterns are you know those known patterns. For example, uh, you know head and shoulders, right? Um, you know turning points known for. Um, the technical analysis in the practice. So the algorithm does not really include any common technical indicators so that the trend and cumulative returns can be compared with or compared against so that the models learn the um, uh, directions that market will go, right? So this is, um, you know, the general feeling about, uh, general feeling about the directions uh, that can, can be improved very easily. So. Um, maybe my suggestion is that maybe we can consider, you know, providing uh, a comprehensive examination of the technical analysis indicators uh, augmented by the cumulative uh, returns that you already have, right? And an example is that, you know, you can include things like moving average, pulling your bands, um, relative strength indicator, right? Things like those. And so that you can have your trend to interact with these commonly known uh, technical analysis indicators. And we know that the model in this case is interacting with those charts and referring to these indicators to find the, pre, uh, the, the price pressures and the, the price support, right? At the same time, I, I think maybe it's a good idea to avoid direct competition with these two uh, existing papers in the literature um, by Kelly and Robot and uh, Zavari, right? Um, so they also do something with technical analysis, especially the Kelly's paper, it's, it's on um, image processing. Okay, so the, the later points are gonna be uh, minor points, right? Um, so first, um, I'm kind of feeling that, you know, it's, it's really hard to imagine what the model is doing if you only feed in the cumulative returns. I don't know what the cumulative returns are capturing in general. So my suggestion is that whether um, you can like link this cumulative return to something that we know, for example, uh, sentiment, or corporate wins that drive up the stock market or drive up the uh, you know, individual stock returns in short period. Um, and uh, the other comment is also related to um, a benchmark that may be included in table one. I think, you know, especially considering that this paper has an implication for the weak form efficient market hypothesis, right? So table one shows the correlation, rank correlation. Uh, across the models, right, across the models that not really include uh, a benchmark for us to really understand how models uh, is how how models are superior comparing to um, how much more superior comparing to a benchmark, right? Um, I, I'm thinking about right. You can probably do something related to the market model or vector models, right? And you can uh, include a comparison across them, and so to to show us that the, you know the machine learning algorithms are actually doing better. Uh, in terms of dis um, distinguishing the good from the bad and, and discovery, the um, uh, discovery uh, the, the, the relations. And the fourth point is that I'm wondering whether you can include more information about the um, OS returns because the two literatures they touch on technical analysis um, and the asset price in the literature, of course. Right? Technical analysis is extremely concerned with some um, uh, transaction costs. Almost all the papers co uh, consider transaction costs. And uh, uh, the asset pricing literature is concerned about other risk exposures, for example, higher moment and uh, uh, you know, maximum drawdown, et cetera. So maybe providing those information as well. And then fifth point, uh, um, just one minute, I guess. Um, so the choice of cumulative returns is very arbitrary in some sense. 
Uh, I think across the platform, you will see that, or different platforms. For example, if you open Yahoo Finance, right, they provide intraday cumulative returns, weekly cumulative returns, and all the way until you know all time cumulative returns. So why um, just use you know months like lag one, lag two, lag three cumulative returns? Um, so my just just suggest to this point is that maybe try other combinations of cumulative returns in general, or maybe just dump them together into the into the algorithm and see which one performs the best and have a brief analysis on that. Um, and sixth point is that table five, I find it's fascinating point and basically shows that the price has, you know, a lag in terms of reflecting the information. Um, and um, so my, my ultimate suggestion for table five is that maybe consider doing a factor model test as well and see how well the models will perform if we wait for a time period to construct uh, the portfolios. And, and then a very minor one on the presentation. So I was kind of confused by the word plot. I thought it's a image processing paper, but it turns out to be a not. So um, I think maybe work a little bit on you know, explaining that ahead so that people do not really uh, directly think that this is image processing paper. Uh, and another thing is about technique details. I think I was trying to look um, for the, some of these details about how the um, neural networks are specified. Um, and uh, I think these can be helpful in terms of understanding the overall goal of the uh, models. And in conclusion, um, you know, um, they have a fascinating paper uh, with concise input. Just 12 cumulative returns can predict out sample future cross sections, right? The predictability loss and goes beyond the forecasting period and the predictability seems not from momentum only. And um, uh, it's a great paper and I recommend everyone just read it. That concludes my comments. Great, thanks Yang. So now let's invite Ahmed back on the last paper in the conference. Uh, but certainly not the least, uh, on covering sparsity and heterogeneity and firm level return predictability. Thanks for the kind words. Um, and thanks very much for having the paper on the program. I'm very, I'm very pleased to be here. Um, so the paper is on uncovering sparsity and heterogeneity and firm level return predictability with machine learning. And it's joined with uh, Theos Evgenio and Rudolfo Prieto. So our setting here uh, and our concern is predicting next month returns for individual US stocks using 101 firm level characteristics and eight market level variables. So anyone who's read Gu Kelly and Xu's recent RFS paper on empirical asset pricing via machine learning uh, would find this a very familiar setting. Um, and our goal here is quite specific. So we want to incorporate heterogeneity in this cross section and determine what impact this has on predictability. We find that this does matter, that in fact it improves out of sample performance. Um, we talk about the prior state of the art as well. And it also gives us a window into interpreting characteristics differently for different groups of firms. Uh, finally, the, uh, we will be using some sparse models that allow us to uncover sparsity in the cross-section, and this interacts nicely with heterogeneity. So these empirical results will come up. And so well, what, what kind of heterogeneity am I talking about here? Because all firms have different characteristics, so all firms are in some ways heterogeneous by definition. Um, to see this, uh, there's a paper by Patton and Weller um, where they take the familiar conditional cap M and consider that different groups of firms um, are priced by risk factors that include a deviation from common risk factors, right? So here, this is a, uh, we're pricing the conditional expected returns um, for a firm I. Each firm I belongs to a group of firms J. So all firms I are priced by a common set of risk factors FT in this vector over here. But there's also um, a matrix phi t, which holds a deviation of the risk premier for each group j of firms. So firms can be priced by different risk factors depending on groupings. This is the sort of heterogeneity that I had in mind. Uh, and since this is a paper on return predictability, in fact, this is in some ways even more natural because um, uh, heterogeneity in firm level uh, return predictability is in fact a natural outcome of equilibrium models with multiple state variables. In particular, the JPE paper by Mensley, Santos, and Veronesi on understanding predictability. Um, they have a habit, uh, an external habit model. It's a dynamic equilibrium model. And in fact, they have some um, firm-specific coefficients in firm predictive relationships. So that's, an, uh, that's one of the consequences of their equilibrium model. Um, 
one form of heterogeneity in firms has already been discussed extensively in the asset pricing literature, and this is industry membership. So there's a relationship between firms, industry memberships, and their financial returns, and a whole bunch of empirical effects that exist in the overall market also exist when conditioning on firm industry. Now, the, the paper I'm presenting today belongs to the recent uh, literature on cross-section return predictability, so firm-level return predictability, taking advantage of machine learning. I already mentioned paper by Gu Kelly Xiu. Uh, there's also papers by Freiberger, Neuhill, and Weber, and, and quite a few others at this point. I have to say that cross-section return predictability is a hard problem. So Ross, in his textbook, Neoclassical Finance, came up with a way of upper-bounding the amount of predictability you can get in the R-squares. Um, and this is surveyed by uh, Rapak and Joe. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about this later on as well, but it's a hard problem. It's hard to get some good out of sample results, but we'll be able to say something about that. Okay, so the simplest model for predicting firm level returns is a linear predictive model, right? So you take this general model of firms next period excess returns. So each return should be the conditional expectation. Um, and the, function, the functional form should be based on some high dimensional vector of predictors if you want to include as much information as possible for the return predictability problem. In our case, this CIT vector is going to include firm level characteristics and market-wide variables. And the simplest form is to have a pooled linear model, right? So you're going to take this high dimensional vector and uh, multiply it by a common vector of coefficients. This common vector of coefficients needs to be estimated on the pooled sample of firms, hence the name, and this can be broadly traced back to the standard conditional CAPM. So that version of the CAPM I showed you due to uh, Patton and Weller uh, includes groupings of firms in this functional form. Here, we don't have any groupings of firms whatsoever. This, so this is uh, by analogy similar to the standard conditional CAPM. Now, where we're going to diverge from this a little bit is by considering bi-group predictive models. So we want to uh, incorporate heterogeneities uh, in these coefficients. And then when we're going to do that to specify group specific coefficients. So again, each firm I will belong to a single group J and each such group J will be associated with a, a theta J vector of coefficients that we're going to multiply by that high dimensional vector of predictive variables. And this is a linear model. Um, so this is a simple a specification of heterogeneity that I think you could get, but there's still a need for machine learning despite the linearity of this, fu of this functional form. First of all, we have a high dimensional vector of predictive variables, and we know that OLS estimation performs poorly empirically. And there's also theoretical problems with high dimensional uh, prediction in that case. And the way we're going to tackle that is by using some very familiar supervised learning techniques. We're going to regularize those vectors of coefficients using lasso, ridge, and elastic net penalties. And as part of this, we're going to choose some additional hyperparameters. Another way that we're going to use machine learning is by grouping firms uh, partitioning the cross-section of firms. Uh, so we're going to start off by taking them as given, but such groupings can also be inferred using unsupervised learning techniques, and we're going to use a classic way of doing so. Uh, I already talked about how there's an extensive literature on firm industries. We're going to take firm industries to be a partition of the cross-section of firms. We're going to use SIC codes and use those to partition firms into 10 industries, or 10 groupings of firms. And the characteristics for return predictability, I mentioned we're going to have 109 of those. 101 will be firm-specific characteristics. These are the usual suspects in some sense, uh, uh, originally due to Greenhand and Jang and Gu Kelly and Xu. And we're going to be using eight market level variables. Again, the original suspects due to Welsh and Guial. We have the 35 year period uh, covered by our sample. And we're going to stick close to Gu Kelly and Xu's paper in terms of our out of sample evaluation strategy. So out of that 35 year period, we're going to split it into training validation and test sets. The validation set will be used to tune our machine learning hyperparameters. Um, and the test set will be used to provide out of sample evaluations of predictive model performances. And we're going to uh, use an expanding window approach to produce six such slices. So we'll have six slices of our uh, 35 year data set. And we'll use the R squared out of sample measure popularized by Gukeli and Xu. Okay, so we want to, our first hypothesis, if you like, is that uh, heterogeneity matters for predictability. So the first exercise we do is to produce out-of-sample prediction R squares using uh, lasso regularized, elastic net regularized, and ridge regularized 
by industry model. So we take the, those 10 industries, to each of those 10 industries, we fit a elastic net over each model, and we consider how those differ uh, in terms of their predictive performance from lasso elastic net and ridge regularized pool models where a single predictive model is fit to the entire pooled cross-section of firms, okay? And these R squared values um, are evaluated by industry. If we take the difference in R squared values between, the, between each by industry model and the corresponding pool model for the same regularization scheme, so for example, a by industry lasso for retail minus the pooled lasso for retail, then we get these um, incremental gains, these incremental R squared out of sample values to incorporate in heterogeneity. If heterogeneity positively impacts predictability, these should be positive. And in fact, we do find that this appears to be the case with a small exception of the extractive industries, so um, agriculture and mining. Now, what we want to do here is get some measure of statistical significance. And here we turn to the non-parametric bootstrap. Um, so what we do is we take 1,000 bootstrap resamples of the entire cross-section of firms and repeat the whole exercise of um, training, uh, hyperparameter tuning, and out-of-sample performance evaluation using these machine learning models. So this is where the use of linear models um, has actually quite helped us because with uh, more complicated non-linear models such as neural networks, this would have been a very expensive exercise to conduct. As it is, we're able to use a non-parametric bootstrap to produce confidence intervals around those incremental R-squared values. And we can see that all the ones that are significant are positive. So this bodes well for our hypothesis. Now, so far we have taken industry groupings as our partition of the cross-section of firms. Our next exercise will be to infer this. This is a paper about characteristics. And so it makes sense, I think, to use characteristics to infer groupings of similar firms. So e such groupings are latent and unobserved variables because we don't know what any true groupings of similar firms should be. And so we're going to turn to unsupervised machine learning techniques to do this, specifically k-means clustering, a very classic algorithm. Um, and I'm sure that many are familiar with this, but a quick recap is that the idea is to minimize um, the total sum of squ uh, within cluster uh, squared Euclidean distances between uh, firms characteristic means and clus uh, cluster centroids. So there's an iterative algorithm uh, that converges when th that objective is minimized and uh, squared Euclidean distance has a nice analogy with, uh, with variances. Uh, one question is how to pick the optimal number of clusters. So we decided to keep things simple and go with a well-known silhouette technique. Um, and the results are as follows. Each, uh, the, these are visualizations of the, uh, the clusterings of firms it turns out that for most of the slices, we have six slices, remember, for most of these slices, three clusters are inferred. And there's only a fleeting, very tiny concentrated cluster in the sixth and final slice, but we kept it in here just as, to stick with the silhouette technique. And this is, uh, the, this, these charts uh, were, quite, uh, were quite welcome when we produced them because these showed that these clusterings appear to be stable as the um, training set expands. Uh, and in fact, these, these visualizations are produced using uh, the first two dimensions of principal component space. Even though we didn't, uh, even though we didn't conduct the games clustering in principal component space, it seems to uh, these clusters appear to be well defined and they appear to be quite stable. So that's nice to see. Clustering uh, firms partitioning the cross section using characteristics means that we need to infer what characteristics were used to produce these clusters. So which characteristics are important to produce this partition of firms? Uh, we, we have two ways of doing that in the paper. The way I present here is we simply take the characteristic, characteristic means. Um, so for a characteristic, for a cluster, take the mean of a particular cluster against all the other clusters and look at which ones have the highest deviations per cluster. And if we do that exercise, we can actually characterize these clusters based on the characteristics of firms. So the first cluster includes more mature firms with lower scale down this earnings forecast, lower likelihood of secured debt, higher operating profitability, et cetera. The second cluster has slightly younger firms, but not the recently IPO'd with below average cash flow to price and below average directional earnings surprises. The third cluster is ones that are younger and recently IPO'd. Um, and the fourth cluster is very concentrated just in SIN stocks. So it's a very tiny cluster and we're going to exclude that from, from some of these subsequent analyses. 
okay, so now that we have this clustering partition, does it help us in, in, um, in uh, does it positively impact predictability if we use this as our measure of heterogeneity? If we uh, repeat the same exercise we did using industries, these are the R squared out of sample results. And we can again, take the incremental R squared out of sample results. Um, so subtracting uh, the R squared of pool models from bi cluster models. And we see that once again, these are positive. And now, once again, we do the whole bootstrap exercise, the expensive exercise of recomputing everything a thousand times. And the confidence intervals produced now appear to be significant almost across the board. So this appears to suggest that we have some statistical evidence, at least, that heterogeneity positively impacts predictability. So this is our first hypothesis, if you like. Now, um, a lot of the papers in this vein, uh, high dimensional return predictability, consider overall predictability and not just by industry or by cluster or by group predictability. So we're going to tackle the same thing. Um, in doing so, we're going to take pool models, by group models, and a hybrid model uh, that we're going to call two-stage models. We have some ability to compare with the prior literature because this is uh, a frequent exercise. Um, I keep talking about the paper by Gu, Kelly, and Xu. So they have an, uh, their best model is a, a neural network. And they, they have an R squared out of sample of 0.4% on their full sample. Of course, we have a slightly different sample. And remember at the very beginning, I said that there are theoretical bounds on how much R squared, how much predictability you can get in this setting. Uh, the survey by Rapak and Joe argues that monthly in-sample R squared values in the neighborhood of 1% or less can signal too much return predictability and the existence of market efficiencies with regard to some asset pricing models. So that's another good number to bear in mind, even though we're not using in-sample values. Okay, so that I mentioned we're going to use two-stage models. So these are meant to be some hybrid of pool models and bi-group models. Uh, if there's any residual predictability at the group level, after estimating a pool model, this will get picked up in, in the residuals, okay? And so the residuals of a pool model are used to estimate a bi-group model. And our results are as follows. So first we take the industry partition and compute aggregate out of sample uh, R squared uh, percentage values. If you focus on pound C, this is trained on our full sample of firms. You can see that we get values like 0.76% of out of sample R squared. Uh, and that this is a two-stage ridge model, so this incorporates um, heterogeneity. So it, ha it trains first on the pool sample of firms, and then it trains bi-group ridge models on each industry level. And you can see here that we're not sensitive to small firms. So if you move from panel C going up to panel A, we focus on the top 2,000 largest firms by market cap, and then the top 1,000 largest firms by market cap, and the results actually improve. So well, we're not uh, focusing on, on, on small firms here at all. Now, if we repeat the exercise with our clustering partition of firms, we get even higher out of sample R squared values. And here, something very interesting besides happens. Here, the best performing models are lasso regularized. So we have two-stage lasso and bi-cluster lasso models, right? So as well as getting values above the 1% R, R, R squared value that, um, that, that the RAPAC and Joe survey talked about, we now have exposed some sparsity in the cross-section of returns. So these lasso regularized models set per, uh, certain coefficients to zero if they are considered not to be important for predicting the uh, outcome variable. And this is uh, sparse. And we can use this sparsity to, uh, as a measure of characteristic importance. Now, there's a lot of ways to assess characteristic importance for machine learning variables in the literature. But if we use lasso regularized models, this is a very natural and inbuilt way of doing so. Okay, when we do this, we find that price-based uh, measures like momentum don't seem to play an important role in, in contrast to some other uh, recently published literature. Instead, our sparse models appear to select lower frequency accounting and analyst-based predictors. I want to emphasize here that doing this means that characteristics enter into our pr procedure in two ways. First, in grouping firms in the partition, in the cross-section of firms, and also in directly predicting next period returns once such groupings are given. Okay, so I don't think this, uh, uh, these two laws for characteristics have previously dis been disentangled in the literature. Um, so I'm just gonna go very quickly because I have about one minute left, I think. Uh, so let's focus on this. This is the bi-group lasso model selected characteristics. We can see here that only a handful out of those 109 predictive variables, only a handful appear to be selected as having some predictive worth by this lasso regularized model. And this isn't a theoretical exercise because 
the lasso regularized models perform the best out of sample on the overall sample when we use clusters as our partition of firms. Okay. Um, a final exercise we do is that we bootstrap this and we're able to uh, select a sample of these that maintain their significance after bootstrapping. And in fact, there's not much difference other than the that fourth tiny fleeting cluster concentrated among, among SIN stocks doesn't seem to be important and doesn't seem to have any predictive um, ability. Okay, um, so I'm just going to conclude at this point. So we departed from uh, recent work investigating high dimensional cross-sectional return predictability um, by considering the role of heterogeneity in the cross-section. We found that this matters for predictability. Um, it allows us to consider characteristics for, uh, along two dimensions, both direct predictive relationships and also how they can be used to partition firms. And finally, we uncovered sparsity in the cross-section using lasso regularized methods. Okay, so thank you very much. I'm looking forward to the discussion. Wonderful, thank you so much, Ahmed. So now our last discussion. Okay, I'm here. Let me just share my screen. Are we good? Yeah, yeah. I see. Okay, well, thank you, everybody. Um, thank you once again for the conference organizers for letting me discuss this paper. It's very interesting. Um, Ahmed did a very good job presenting it. Um, so I'm not going to give a, a full kind of overview and review of the paper. I don't think that's necessary. I'd rather spend my time um, giving feedback. Um, so but I will give a very short summary. So the objective is to propose this two-step machine learning methodology um, to predict the cross-section of future returns. And, and the big kind of contribution is this clustering and, and to use characteristics to cluster. And then, um, and, and they use the K-means approach. And then within each cluster, they're gonna apply um, linear machine learning techniques, okay? The, the, the three standard linear machine learning techniques. Um, and, and the idea is, is that um, within each cluster, the, um, the, the predictive function or the forecasting function might be different, okay? And empirically, bottom line, um, you know, we saw this in all the results that were just presented, the two-step process works quite well. It, it's substantially better than the pooled forecast, and it also beats using industry clusters. Um, and the big conclusion for the paper draws is that heterogeneity matters, okay? The relation between characteristics and expected returns depends on what kind of stock it is, and, and, the, and the k, k means learn, uh, clustering methodology seems to pick up these different kinds of stocks pretty well. So, um, my overall impression, I'll just start with that, is it's a, a very well executed paper. The methodology is sound. Uh, it does a good job at alleviating concerns of bias. So, so that's always a big concern in this literature. It has been since Cam Harvey published his paper and several other papers. And, and I think it's a legitimate concern. And, and I'm not concerned about that here. Um, so I think the results are very interesting. The out of sample predictive power is very strong, um, even among large stocks, uh, much stronger than the pooled models. And I think a big benefit here is that by focusing on linear methodologies, they're able to give some substance to the predictions, which, which a lot of papers, if you're using a neural network, for example, it, you can't really do that. It's much more difficult to do that. Um, so so that, that adds a little bit of economic content that I think is valuable um, and, and also makes it more impressive, I think. Um, especially in light of the Gu Kelly Shu results that kind of show that the neural networks tend to do better in this sort of setting. Um, so my comments, I've got my first two comments are really about this characteristic based cluster, uh, which is um, the essence of the paper. And the first comment is, is characteristic clustering or is clustering by characteristics really what we wanna do? And, and what I mean by this, it is we want to, the objective here, as far as I understand it, is to generate clusters where the same variables are important for predict, prediction. So I wanna generate, I wanna find the stocks where book to market is important. There may be a bunch of stocks where book to market is unimportant. 
right? I want to identify the stocks where book to market is important. Or I want to identify the stocks where profitability is important, right? Um, so really the objective shouldn't, may not, we, we may want to rethink this, or we may want to at least draw the, um, the connection between um, this characteristics-based clustering and identifying clusters for, for which stocks within that cluster, the same variables are important for forecast. So this is um, kind of fundamental to the paper and I don't have a great idea how to do this. And I think the results actually speak to this. Um, and, and this kind of meshes in with my second comment that I'll get to shortly. Um, but so, so, so that's kind of conceptually, um, I challenge the authors to, to kind of bridge that gap. Um, and, and my second comment is, is related to this, which is what are the implications of the character-based clusters? Um, so my initial thought is that by clustering on characteristics, we're going to basically reduce the heterogeneity Within each cluster, stocks are going to be reasonably homogeneous, right? So if I, for example, just book to market is the, the easiest example. If I, if I saw it on book to market, we all know historically, although it's gotten weaker recently, right? Historically, this has produced return spreads. But if now I cluster on stocks and I cluster on, I, I basically form clusters based on book to market ratio, I've got very little heterogeneity within in book to market ratio among the stocks in the cluster. So, so the fact that this works so well is, is a little bit surprising to me. It suggests that the clustering is being done on some characteristics and the predictive power is coming from characteristics that are not being used in the clustering stage. Um, and this is where I really would like the paper to dig into and see if they could really untangle this. Um, to me, if you could say, well, look, maybe it's maybe for old stocks, book to market matters, and for young stocks, profitability matters or investment matters, something like this. But it seems uh, really the big comment is, is for this to work well, the cluster formation must be driven by different variables than are the than than, than are being that then are the, the force behind the predictive power. Um, so to really de disentangle that, I think would um, really add value to the paper. Um, aside from that, I, I have my, the rest of my comments are pretty straightforward. I'd like to see a, a portfolio analysis, just a very standard, um, you know, you, I believe everything you do is panel. Um, panel, we can't really disentangle cross section versus time series. Um, so I'd like to see a portfolio analysis that just gives us some economic sense of the magnitude. You know, 1.91 out of sample R squared is incredibly high. Um, so, so I imagine that you will get very high sharp ratios and, R, and T stats, et cetera. Um, but I'd, it'd be nice to see it. Um, and, and also that that allows you to kind of run a factor model analysis on it um, and, and do other analyses that, that, that will, will, I think, strengthen um, your argument for the predictive power. Um, and the second comment is, I'd like to see you highlight the differences in forecasting functions across clusters. So to really convince me that this clustering is very important, right? And to, to convince me that I guess the, the concern is that maybe the clusters are picking up just different means. Because I, I, I believe your model um, allows for within, me, within cluster means as well as within cluster sensitivities to different um, variables. So I, I'd like to see whether it's the within cluster means or within cluster sensitivities that's really driving this. And, and the way you could do this is you could basically use a, a forecasting function that is generated from one cluster and apply that, that function to a separate, to another cluster. And if it doesn't work at all, that's very interesting. Okay, it, it really means you're, you're, you're doing exactly what you claim to do. I think it would really strengthen your case. 
Um, so in conclusion, I think this is a very nice work. It's really interesting. Um, the empirical results speak for themselves. It's well executed, well written. Um, I think if you could bridge that conceptual gap with the clustering versus the, the, my first comment and then a few additional tests, I think um, you have a very strong paper here. So thank you for the opportunity to discuss. Thank you for writing a great paper. Um, and good luck with it. Wonderful. Thank you, Scott. So that brings us to the end of the program. It's been, I think, a tremendous conference. I'm very grateful to all of you who have participated in it and made it so. Uh, hopefully we will be able to do this again.